Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking your time out of your day to listen to the presentation of a non-classical approach for determination of PAHs through an automated extraction platform. Uh, my name is Tyler Trent. I am the application specialist here at Teledyne Techmark. So just going over a brief topics of today, we're going to go through who is Teledyne Techmark, uh, poly um, polycitric aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, what are they, where they come from, and a few uh, facts of how they are harmful to humans. Then we're going to go through some classical testing for PAHs from the 80s to the current. Then we're going to have a go through the Automate Q40, the automated extraction platform. Then we're going to go through two experiments. The first experiment is the extraction of PAHs from PM10 filters from a, um, a source of coal burning fire plants. The next experiment is extraction of the EU15 plus one pH is from soil. So who is Teledyne Techmore? We are located here in Mason, Ohio. The products and services that we offer are instrumentation for the environmental, food safety, pharmaceutical, and laboratory testing. We are um, ISO 9001 certified. We specialize in different types of technologies. First, we specialize in Persian trap and headspace. Here is the Atomics, which is a multi-matrix auto sampler for Persian trap. The next area we specialize in is TOCDTN. This is the brand new Lodix that was just released last year. Then we also do the automation platform, which will be the bulk of this conversation. Um, this is the Automate Q40. It was specifically designed for catchers, but we have been able to modify different types of extractions to fit onto the system. So what are PAHs? PAHs are organic compounds comp comprised of fused aromatic rings. There are two different classifications of PAHs. There's your lights and there's your heavies. So your lights have less than four aromatic rings and your heavies have more than four aromatic rings. These PAHs can dissolve well in water, but the, the solubility of the PAHs decreased as the molecular mass increases. So the heavier the, the PAH weight is, the less likely it is to, to dissolve in water and it might settle in the sediment of a riverbed instead of in the water. And over here are just different types of examples of PAH compounds from very light compounds from like anthracene all the way up to the benzo GHI proline. So where do PAHs really come from? Well, they, they can also exist naturally in our environment, but they also come from incomplete burning of carbon containing material. So when we have bonfires, when we burn oil, when we burn garbage, um, coal, different types of fuels, they they form when the carbon is not completely combusted. So basically, where we get our optimal amounts of PAHs, they're formed when the burning occurs anywhere from 500 to 700 degrees. And these are just different pictures of, say, a barbecue, the fuel, and making um, of different types of metal, where the PAHs can come from. PAHs from fires can also bind with ashes, and they can travel long distance through the air. So this is how we get our spread of our PAHs. Also, large amounts of PAHs are emitted during the processing, uh, during the production of aluminum or metals or coke. But also, some PAHs are found in the rivers and groundwater. So the lighter ones are water soluble, so they will be dissolved in the water. But the heavier ones, more than four, uh, aromatic rings, um, the larger ones will actually bind into the sediment of the riverbed. And these are just two different examples of lighter and a heavier PAH. Um, so PAH is in food and drinking water. So our PAHs can come in from, say, grilling um, smoked or charcoal uh, foods are a source of pH exposure. The European Union has methods and regulatory limits for these out there. 
Um, vegetables, they really don't take up uh, significant amounts of pHs in the soil because the pHs will bind and stay in the soil. Uh, pHs may be in the groundwater near the disposal site where construction uh, waste or the ash is buried. Um, people may be exposed through the lighter ones through drinking water. We also have uh, pHs and fish. Um, the metabolism of the pHs in the vertebrates show no significant accumulations in the fish meat. But when you're eating shellfish living in a contaminated water, um, there might be some source of pH exposure, such as the oil spill down in the Gulf that occurred a few years back. Uh, a lot of the, the bottom feeders were being tested for pH exposure. So what are some of the human health impacts? So how do the pHs enter our body and leave our body? No. So through breathing contaminated air, so by the fire when the ashes are coming up, eating food or drinking water contaminated with pHs, um, skin contact with pH contaminated soil or products such as heavy oil, coal, tar, roofing, and creosote. They target organs include the kidneys and livers, and pHs will, will leave our body through excretion in a matter of days. But there are some long-term health effects associated with um, overexposure. So you could have kidney or liver damage or jaundice. Um, contact with the skin may induce redness or skin irritation or inflammation. Um, being exposed to large, large amounts of naphthalene can cause breakdown of red blood cells. Um, then also you have skin, lung, bladder, and gastro cancers that can form by overexposure of different types of pHs. So classical pH testing methods. Well, back in the 80s, the US EPA was very concerned um, with pHs in different environmental matrices. So they were looking at it and um, filters coming off a coal fire plant, soil, water, um, river sediment. So there was a number of methods that were developed and standardized for this extraction of pHs. So some of the extractions for the pHs in solids and liquids were developed through a soxalate extraction, liquid liquid, um, supercritical fluid extraction, pressurized liquid extraction, and many others, the list just continues and keeps going on. So right here are some of the pH uh, testing methods for the, that the US EPA uses. So you have methods 8100, 8310, 8260, 3630. All these methods at least contain pAHs. And the list just continues. But also, the European Union has other methods out there, or other um, methods for food, water, and ambient air, as you can see here listed on the right. So what we did here, what I want to do here is show you the, the European Union, the Environmental Protection Agency from the US, and the European Scientific Community for Food all look for these certain types of pHs. Here are the main ones that they look for. And as you can see, some of the EPA ones will cross-reference with the EU ones and also with the European Scientific Committee for Food. Um, so as you can see, benzoapyrene is part of all three of them. Um, pyrene itself is just for the EPA list. Naphthalene is on the EPA list. Uh, but there's also ones that are just dedicated for the EU um, so this, we do have a lot of different um, crossovers for what we look for, for in the, here in the United States and also abroad in Europe. What I'd like to go through right now is the Automate Q40. What it is, what is it? It is the automated extraction platform. So it's a revolutionary system specified designed to optimize and automate the catchers of sample extraction. Um, so it offers, offers a comprehensive solution to the catcher's extraction method. 
So it has a system capability of doing 40 samples at a time. But over, say, a 24 hour, uh, over a 16 hour period, you'll be able to process anywhere up to 80 samples. It was, was designed to automate portions of the original unbuffered buffered method, AOC 2007, and the EN 15662 method. The system is capable of method customization. So what we did here was we basically took the catcher's method and we made an extraction method for PAHs. The system handles 50 and 15 milliliter conical centrifuge tubes. And over here you can just see the photos of the automatic Q40 itself. Um, up top is the full system picture and down below on the right is basically the robotic arm, the uh, capping and decapping station, and the salt delivery station, the powder loader station. So what's not automated? First, you still have to do your sample homogenization. You have to weigh the sample into the 50 milliliter vials. You have to load the sample tray into the unit. You have to make sure all your consumables are placed in the unit. So the, the cleanup that you will be using, um, the loading of the final extract tubes for the final extract to be used, um, then loading of the disposable pipette tips. So now what is automated? We're going to automate the addition of the extraction solvents, addition of the spikes and standards, addition of the extraction salts and buffers. We're going to do the shade. We're going to do the sample vortexing for you. Also, we're going to centrifuge. We're going to decant or transfer the liquid from one vial to another vial. DSPE cleanup, preparation of the final extract, preservation, and vial addition. So right here is basically just an overview of the unit itself. As you can see here, there are eight trays that hold five samples apiece, which gives you your 40 samples. In the back left-hand corner is the shaker. The, you have the pumpers, the syringe drives, deliver a precise and accurate amount of solvent or standard to the sample. Um, the centrifuge meets all European and um, AOAC method uh, requirements. The sample shuttle and the capping station is where the vials will be capped, decapped, the solvent will be added to the sample, the solid dispenser will add the uh, extraction salts, then there's a vortexer, um, and there's a, a touchscreen interface for you to run your samples to make your schedules and methods off of. So here's just a closer up picture of the Automate Q40. On the left-hand side, you'll see the, the, the sample vial trays and also the shaker. The shaker will shake two 15 milliliters and two 50 milliliter vials um, at a time. There's also, on the trays, you see there's a row of 50s and two rows of 15s. So the left-hand side 50 milliliter vial is the sample. The middle row 15 milliliter vial contains your DSPE cleanup. Then the final, final row on the right hand side of the tray is your final extract valve, the liquid that will be transferred off your DSPE and I'll be taken over to your analytical laboratory for analysis. On the right hand side you'll see the picture of the, the pumpers in the background, the robotic arm doing the pipetting or the decanting, um, the upper cappers holding the caps of the vials, the lower capper holding the vial. Um, this is where the capping and decapping takes place. Then also you have the powder loader, which contains your catcher's extraction salts or, say, uh, a custom blend of salts. And that will be able to be delivered into your 50 milliliter vial for your extraction. So we, we the me method comes standard. Um, the system comes standard with two methods, the AOSC and the EN. Basically, these were taken from both official methods and, and incorporated into the unit. But what we can do is we can method optimize. So this is how we were able to do some of the PA, PAH extractions on the unit. Um, we were able to use different types of solvents inside the unit. So it's set up to use acetonitrile, 1% acetic acetonitrile, uh, water, uh, acidified methanol, um, ethyl acetate. But one thing that we did for 
some of these pH extractions was we used a mixture of hexane and DCM. So the system can handle multiple different solvents at a time. The solvent delivery, um, up to three solvents at, at once, if you choose to, we can deliver in 0.1 mil increments. Um, we can deliver uh, one solvent up to 25 mils, but we're not allowed to put no more than 40 milliliters of solvent into the vial, so we don't overfill the vial. So what we see here now is the next part of the, of the method optimization, so the extraction slash, um, so the salt and the centrifugation. So the solid dispenser, which I showed you previously, it holds a two kilogram jug of specified salts. It could be the AOAC mixture, it could be the EN mixture, it could be an unbuffered mixture, or it could be uh, a custom blend that you, that you choose. So we do single dose volumes that vary up to four to nine grams. And if you need larger than nine grams, the sample can receive up to three different doses. So we can, we can tell it to rotate the, the dispenser three times to give you more salt. Centrifuge meets all method requirements across the EN and AOAC. Um, we can run the centrifuge anywhere from zero to 60, 60 minutes. So right here, you see we're moving on to the mix and vortexing. So we have a sample vortex. So after all the solvents have been added, we want to maybe hit it with a quick vortex. The vortex are mixes at 3,000 RPMs. Uh, we, can, we can vortex anywhere from zero to 30 minutes. The sample shaking, uh, the sample shakes at 420 oscillations per minute. And we again, we can vary the time anywhere from zero to 30. So what we see here is the DSPE cleanup page. So this is going to be all together for our cleanup. So what are we going to do to our cleanup? This is an optional step according to the catcher's method or the protocol. Um, so we can click either yes or no. The DSPE transfer volume. So how much we're taking from our li uh, solid liquid extraction over to our DSPE cleanup. It transfers in 0.1 milliliter increments. So we can go all the way up to 14 mil, zero to 14 milliliters, or depending on how much we can take off the top of our sample um, from the solid liquid extraction. Um, once again, the DSP mix time, the mixer will shake the DSPE at 420 oscillations per minute, and it can be ran anywhere from zero to 30 minutes. Centrifuge is the same thing as the first part of the centrifuge. It meets all method requirements and we can run the centrifuge anywhere from zero to 60 minutes. But if we don't want to do that, all we have to do is click no. And then this step is completely skipped. So we have options of running different types of methods within the system. The final extract volume is the amount of final extract. So the DSPE volume, how much volume we're actually transferring off the top of the DSPE. As once again, we can transfer anywhere from 0 uh, 0.1 milliliter increments all the way up to 14 mils. This is where we cap you out at. So it also depends on how much liquid you can get off top of your DSPE. So as we move forward, we're going to start talking a little bit about different experiments that we have done. So the first experiment that we have done was the extraction of PAHs from PN10 filter. This was actually brought to me as an idea from a customer to see if this could uh, be done. So the EU and the US EPA monitors and regulates pHs in ambient air. Particle bound filters are generally sampled on quartz, on quartz or glass filter fibers, uh, fiber filters. A lot of the times these are done by com common solvent based extractions are carried out in these filters. So you have your sock slit, your ultrasonication, um, and um, ACE, so accelerated solvent extraction. These extractions are time consuming, laborious, intensive, and requires a large amount of, of chlorinated solvents, which are not green. So what we wanted to do was 
try to do a modified catch resist traction. See if it's, um, if we can apply that to the pHs and PM10 filters. What we did was we found a, a paper out there, um, as you can see in the bottom left hand corner, um, it's called a, a really quick, easy, cheap, effective, rugged, safe extraction procedure for the analysis of particle bound pHs in ambient air emission samples. So what we did was we kind of took their work and, mod and modified it a little bit to fit our unit. So what we found was ke the catchers offers excellent sensitivity and selectivity when it comes to the extraction. So the experiment, we basically got some PM10 filters um, that, have been, that have been sampled out in the field. We wanted to automate the extraction, so we used a modified catcher's extraction. Um, to extract the PMs, uh, to extract the pHs off the filters. We did a target analysis by selective ion, ion monitoring on the GCMS. We did quantification based upon average relative response. Then we also did a QC check based upon the relative response and also a calibration curve. So we had multiple ways to verify that what we were extracting off the filters were true. So right here is a little excerpt I took from the, um, the catcher's extraction procedure for analysis of particle bound pHs in air. They did a lot of upfront work for this. Um, so as you can see here, according to the graph, the, the pink dot is accelerated solvent extraction, ACE. Then also they end up looking at a catcher's with an acetyl nitrile direct inject extraction. A catcher's extraction with acetyl nitrile that is reduced or blown down. A catcher's acetyl nitrile extraction plus uh, sodium sulfate as the extraction salt. Um, then they also did a direct to that, a reduce it, ex ex extract. Then they also did a hydration step where they did the catcher's with acetyl nitrile water and the sodium sulfate, both direct inject and uh, reduced extraction. As you can see, for most of these compounds, they are pretty much similar across the board. So this is one way that you can tell that the modified catcher's extraction should work for these compounds off of these filters because of the previous work that was done by this group. So what did we do? For, for us, we ended up doing, we ended up taking the PM10 PM filter extraction. So we decided to cut the filters so we can get better surface area interaction inside the tube. So we placed the cut filters inside the 50 milliliter extraction tube. The scissors were washed and cleaned between each, each cut, um, each uh, filter. The, the tubes were placed in the automatic Q40. Basically what we did, instead of using the um, magnesium sulfate, like the previous work they've done, has presented, we ended up using um, the unbuffer catcher salts. So the automatic Q40 then, did at, then added 10 milliliters of acetyl nitrile and vortex to sample for one minute. Then after the vortex, the system added five grams of unbuffered catcher salts. Then we ended up shaking the tube and centrifuging it for one minute. We skipped the cleanup step and we ended up transferring three milliliters into the final 50 milliliter tube. Then we uh, direct injected one microliter in the GC. Um, some of these samples didn't really need to be cleaned up, um, but there could be some more uh, experiments done, maybe using a floor cell cleanup, the loose floor cell cleanup inside the DHP tube to see if that really um, uh, would help, the, help clean up the extraction at all. But for, for what we did, we did not do that. So right here is the, the GC parameters. Um, chromatogram is in SIM, obviously. It's a very low level SIM. As you can see, we have some different transition rises. Um, we used a uh, Restec um, RSI 5MS column, um, the standard 30 meter 0 0.25, 0 0.25 um, column that is used for pesticides and PAHs. Um, basically, we did, we did a short, shorter runtime since we were looking at the um, the lighter pHs, which were 20, which the runtime was about 21 minutes. 
Um, we also did this in SIM, and we kept our EI source pretty high, about 230. So our average relative response was accomplished by extracting blank samples that was spiked with 100 microliters of a 220 nanogram um, per mil um, spiking solution of PAHs. So basically, and when we get to the system, 2.2 picograms per microliter were injected onto the GC. We did this multiple times so we can come up with a average. So we ended up doing about seven blank extractions and with seven different spikes so we could come up with our, our average, um, our relative average response for all the compounds. Um, anthracene D10 was our internal standard. Um, as you can see, we have crysine D D12 also. So we did have some internal standards mixed in here. So we can validate also off that. So right here, this is a bunch of different uh, sample filters that we have, that we retained off. And then we send them through the extraction. Um, uh, it's kind of cumbersome. There's a lot of numbers on here. But as you can see, we, we did extract uh, PAHs off of certain filters. There's naphthalene present in, some, in a few filters, all the way up to uh, benzo, GH, um, perline, perline, and different filters. And some of them were not present at all, such as anthrocene. So from that, we want to verify and make sure our numbers were correct, or, or what, what we extracted off of the filters were correct. So what we did was, after each sample, we ran a blank spike check. So we ended up calculating the average, um, calculating the, the recovery with relative response. And as you can see, everything really checked out pretty well. We had some recoveries that were kind of high, um, with some that came out about 120%, but we also had some recoveries that came out at about 77%. So we were within our plus or minus uh, windows that we that we were required to use um, for these samples. And another way that we checked checked to make sure that we were recovering correctly was we ended up doing it with against a calibration curve also. Um, so we, we we did two different ways to validate that we were actually recovering very well. Um, as you can see, most of the compounds are within the, the correct recovery range that we were looking for. So what did we take from this experiment? Well, we demonstrated the Automate Q40 ability to successfully process PN10 filters. Um, there could be some other different work done. Is there a cleanup needed? Um, could we better the extraction by using uh, sodium sulfate instead of magnesium sulfate? There's a lot of different ways to go through and try to uh, make this experiment work a little bit better or on different routes like that. Um, but the Automate Q40 enables reliable and more reproducible extraction results. It also allows significant um, for this since a lot of steps were cut out from from the SOX lid or from the sonication or or the ACE extraction, it allowed for some time savings and also labor savings for your extraction laboratory. And another another big issue is that it cuts down on solvent usage for a greener extraction. We're not using the chlorinated solvents anymore. We're, we're use, or leaders of that. We're using smaller amounts of say acetonitrile or smaller amounts of ethyl acetate or acidified methanol to do these types of extractions. So it is much of a greener extraction, better for the environment. What, we, what we're doing now is the next experiment, we wanted to focus on the EU15 um, pH list. And we, and we did them from soil. So the EU and the US EPA have monitored and regulated pHs in soil since the, since the early 1980s. Um, once again, there are common solvent-based extractions that are carried out in these soils, like the SOX lid, ultrasonication, 
and A's. And as I said previously, these these extractions are time consuming, consuming, labor intensive, and requires a large amount of chlorinated solvents. So what we did was we wanted to do a modified catcher's extraction for the soil to see if it see if we could get the recoveries that we wanted. And since we already knew knew no catchers offers a excellent selectivity and sensitivity for for most compounds. So what we did here was for the automated uh, EU 15 plus 1 PAH extraction method, we weighed one gram of soil. So the soil, we ended up buying bulk soil from a local hardware store. Um, we, we dried it overnight, and then we ended up sieving it um, to get uniform particle sizes throughout. Then we ended up taking one gram of that soil and placing it into the 15, 50 milliliter polypropylene centrifuge tube. What we did for, for the catcher's extraction to work, we needed to hydrate the sample. I know we dried the sample, but we wanted to add a little bit of water to it to help. So we added five milliliters of water. And then also, we ended up doing a mixture of hexane and dichloromethane. So, so 95 to 5 of a 10 milliliter, 10 milliliter hexane DCM mix. Um, but we only used a very little, uh, small amount of dichloromethane. So it is, in fact, a little bit of a greener extraction. Uh, we vortex the sample for one minute. After, after one minute, we wanted to add 6.5 grams of unbuffered catcher's salts. Instead of doing the normal five grams of catcher's extraction salts, we bumped it up to 6.5 to help oversaturate it. And then we shook, shook vigorously for two and a half minutes. Since soil, since the soil turned into a little bit thicker of a of a of a of a like a mud material, we we wanted to shake a little bit longer so we have for better extraction efficiencies. Then we centrifuged for five. We transferred four milliliters into the final extraction tube, and we basically injected one microliter sample onto the GCMS. So right here are our uh, parameters. For this, count, for this uh, separation on the GC, we actually reached out to Restec and they have the brand new RXI pH column. Um, they, they were very kind to send us one to do this experiment on and the research on for this. So the, the, the column um, is the RXI pH um, column. It is a 40 meter by 0.18 by 0.07. Um, the, the oven run program was provided to us through one of their ResTech blogs. Um, I believe Jack Cochran did it. And then the rest of the inlet and um, flows were determined by them also. We, we ran the uh, MS and SIM again, and we, had our, and we increased our EI source all the way up to 270, 276 for these pHs. As you can see on the right-hand side is our soil calibration, so our R-squared values in the molecular masses that we used. All the calibration ranges are um, values are 0.99 or better, all the way up to 1. So right here is just the separation. Obviously, it's a little bit of a runtime. It's a, probably about a 60-minute runtime. Um, but as you can see here, we have separation of all key components that we needed. Um, some columns will not separate out the benzo K, the benzo J, uh, and the benzo B um, for anything. Um, so with this column, it actually allowed us to separate it so we can quantify both of them, all three, all three compounds individually. And like I said before, um, we use the, the RXI pH column by Restec. It completely separates the benzo, uh, B, K, J, and A fluorinthines. It also separates priority compounds such as benzo A, anthracene, chrysine, um, and others. Right here is basically the, the benzo B, K, and J completely separated. Um, you don't have baseline separation in the on the last two, but its separation allows you to quantify and be able to calibrate it correctly for these compounds. So what we did here was a precision accuracy study was performed using the automate Q40. 
Um, basically, the limits that we took for these EU 15 plus ones came from came from Europe. Um, basically, what they're looking for in a non-industrial site is 0.1 to 0.2. Uh, 0.1 is the lowest level they would like to detect, and 0.2 milligrams was just another um, precision accuracy check point for us. So, basically, right here, what you see is different um, the different compounds with their different recoveries at the 0.1 um, milligram per kilogram and the 0.2 milligram per kilogram. For the low level, we averaged an 87.9% uh, recovery with a 2.2% RSD. For the higher end, the, the 0.2 uh, milligrams per kilogram, we recovered uh, an, on average 92.2 and we have an RSD of 3.6. So what we did, I wanted to do see if water really made a difference because we added water to the extraction. Um, so basically for this, we did a quick little experiment of the EU15 plus one pHs um, from soil without water. And there's the parameter. So basically we just removed the water, water addition step. And as you can see, the recoveries were pretty well also for that point one. Um, but for our unit, we determined we have to use the water to help us to help us get uh, separation in for the pipetting. Um, for for this, without the water, we recovered any on average 103 to point, 103 point six, and we had a pretty decent uh, percent RSD at 5.4. So, what did we take from this experiment that we did? Was it demonstrates the automated Q40's ability to successfully process soil samples for pHs and a modified catcher's distraction. We had combined pH spike recoveries of 90% with an average RSD of 2.9%. This also allows for time and labor savings for the extraction laboratory. So with this, the Automate Q40 enables you to achieve improved precision and accuracy uh, for the catcher sample pre preparation methods being conducted. It allows you to add sample capacity to your laboratory without adding staff or paying overtime. This also reduces negative impact on your laboratory um, that it has on the environment. So a greener extraction, more friendly extraction for, for the environment. It improves workplace safety because everything is contained within a, a fume hood for the extraction. Um, for that, I would like um, Teledyne Tech more would like to thank uh, Chris English of Restech for supplying the analytical columns um, for the GC separation and the EU15 uh, pH 15 plus 1 standards. Then also Julie Gorski of, of Restech for her technical support and method development with along with Jack Cochran for, give, for helping us with the separation uh, to optimize the GC separation for these distractions. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy work day to attending the webinar.